In today's video, we're going to go through a complete list of items that I think are positively the most important to have in your home exercise toolkit if you are someone that has arm spasticity. So I know I've made a ton of videos on arm spasticity, but what I hope to accomplish in this video is briefly explain what spasticity is or what it might look like so that you know whether or not you have spasticity in your arm, as well as what I would consider kind of like the essentials in a toolkit to help you manage that spasticity or minimize the impact that it has on your arm rehab exercises. If you're new to this channel, I'm Tara, I'm a neurologic physical therapist, and on this channel we talk about anything and everything related to mobility, health, fitness, and mindset in the context of neurologic injury with the end goal of empowering you with as many tools as possible to take ownership of your rehab and your health to live an overall more active, more mobile, pain-free, happier, healthier life. Now, before we dive into the meat and potatoes of this video, as a reminder, we do have a membership program. Our membership programs start as little as $5 a month for an annual membership. With your $5 bronze membership, you will get access to our private Discord channel where you can inter interact with me and other members, as well as access to any handouts that might go along with these videos that we have here on YouTube. To learn more about that, visit www.rehab-hq. Dot com. That would also be where you can sign up if you want to join our community. But now back to the video. Okay, so first and foremost, what is arm spasticity? First and most important thing to know about spasticity is it is a sign that you have damage to your brain or your spinal cord. So the good news is, is if you've had imaging done and you know that you don't have any damage to your brain or your spinal cord, there is a good chance or almost 100% chance that you do not have spasticity. So again, if you have spasticity, there would be some kind of a lesion or damage that shows up on an MRI or some form of imaging that looks for damage to the brain or spinal cord. That's very, very important because I'm getting more people on this channel that don't have any neurologic damage showing up on any images. And in that case, I would say that there's a good chance that it's not spasticity. But now, if you do have damage to your brain or your spinal cord, yes, you may have spasticity. What spasticity is, it's an involuntary contraction in a muscle. There's different theories on why this happens after damage to a motor area of the brain. The explanation that makes the most sense to me is just that our brain is very, very involved in inhibiting movement. So if you look at infants, they're just kind of like moving all around all the time. As our brains develop, the way we develop motor control is we actually learn how to inhibit certain muscle groups. And that's a lot what allows us to crawl and coordinate movement as we stand and jump and move through our environment as we age. So potentially, when you lose that control from the motor areas of the brain, you lose that inhibition and you get some hyperactivity in a muscle group. Another explanation that makes a lot of sense to me is that there's something called a reflex arc and that the reflex arc is involved. And what the reflex arc is, is it's a protective mechanism that's built into all of our muscles that detects when a muscle is being lengthened too rapidly. So a quick stretch on a muscle, it will actually cause that muscle to relax in the hopes that it'll prevent that muscle from being damaged. That's called our stretch reflex. This is an inhibitory mechanism that's built in. This explanation makes a lot of sense to me because a lot of times you see a stronger contraction with a, more, a faster lengthening. So when I see that, the explanation of the stretch reflex being involved makes a lot of sense to me. But in any case, there's different theories on why this happens. Bottom line is, is spasticity is when a muscle contracts when you don't want it to contract. If you've had a stroke, the most common areas in the arm where you see this are in the bicep muscle so that you'll see your muscle bend up or you'll see your elbow bend up in this direction involuntarily, or you'll see your wrist and your hand clench up involuntarily. And there's some shoulder muscles here in the front that I think also develop some spasticity that rotate that arm inward and bring it forward and bring that shoulder blade forward. So any of those where you feel like your arm is just doing these, these types of movements involuntarily, 
might mean that you are experiencing some spasticity. So if you've been following me for a while, I use a ton of tools to help minimize these involuntary contractions so that we can focus on voluntary, normalized movement. So in most cases, I like tools that keep the elbow straight because this is a very strong spastic pattern a lot of times where the arm bends up, tools that keep the wrist straight. And when you can do that, it is easier to activate muscles on the opposite side of the joint, which in the long term is your best shot at decreasing the severity of that spasticity. So you've got really overactive muscles on one side of a joint pulling it in one direction. If we can kind of get the brain involved to activate the muscles on the opposite side of the joint, there's a better chance that that spasticity is not going to be as severe. So who is someone that should consider using tools for the elbow? Well, if you are working on shoulder movements and every time you do it, your arm is bent up like this or your arm wants to rotate inward, usually those two go together, I would, do, I would use tools to make sure that you're not getting those movements so that you can normalize a movement pattern, meaning you can reach your arm forward and extend your elbow eventually, right? Or that you could reach out to the side and extend your arm out to the side. That's where tools for the elbow become really, really valuable. Who might want to consider something for the wrist? Well, if every time you go to reach your hand really fists up, then you would want to consider tools for the elbow so that you could isolate shoulder movement without that hand clutching up. Because what's the point of working shoulder movement if you're letting that hand clench up because you're gonna get, you might get that shoulder movement back but you don't have a functional hand because the hand has learned how to stay clenched up when you move the shoulder. So that's when I would be thinking or considering something to keep the hand at least partially open or somewhat straight. And that are the tools that we go through today are gonna be included in that, okay? So hopefully all of that makes sense and as we go through the tools, you'll kind of be able to decide which ones are best for you. But now let's go ahead and dive into the tools that are on my list of the most essential for improving arm movement. All right, number one is an air splint. Now, I know I've talked about this in other videos, but the reason I'm bringing it up again in this video is because I've had some questions recently There's uh, as to which air splint to get. So there are a few different ones. So I'm gonna go through the pros and the cons of each air splint. So basically you put your arm inside of this, You zip it up and you fill it with air. You pump it up and it keeps your arm straight. Now, the first question I get a lot about this is it's too long. It goes past my hand, right? And you can see that it clearly does and it does on most people and that is the point. So the reason it's valuable to have something that goes past your hand when you're working on shoulder movement is so that it will keep the wrist straight and the elbow straight and you can isolate shoulder movement. All right, so again, this is for someone who wants to isolate shoulder movement. But then there's this one, and some people have asked me about this shorter one, and this is actually one for the hand. So some people have purchased this one thinking, well, I, the long one is too long, and so I need the shorter one but this is really to keep the hand straight. So if you're someone where you're starting to want to incorporate elbow movement, but you still get a lot of wrist flexion, that's where I love the wrist one because it'll keep your hand and your wrist straight. Ideally, you wanna do this with a paddle on, depending on your paddle or your splint that you have for your hand. Some of them fit in this, some of them don't, but that's when I would incorporate this. So. I like the longer one if you have a lot of elbow and wrist involuntary movement that you're trying to avoid. I like to go to this wrist one if you're someone that you're starting to wanna to work your elbow a little bit more but you want to keep your hand open and keep it from clenching up. That's why you would go to this shorter one. But there's one other one that I wanna mention and it's the leg one. And I'm talking about it in the arm video because I do use this one sometimes for the arm. Um, it's got two valves on it, so it 
because it's intended to keep the legs straight, I sometimes feel that there's more, it's more durable if you're someone that has a lot of tone in the arm. So yes, it is bulkier. It will be bigger around when you get it blown up. But I do find that someone that has a lot of tone, sometimes going to a leg one does work for the arm. The other reason I like the leg one is that because it's wider, you can put your hand splint on and put this on top of it. Whereas with the arm one, it's just not big enough around to have your hand splint on because that comes all the way down over the hand. So I do just want to mention the leg one is an option that some of you might want to try for your arm rehab. Again, it's a little bit heavier and a little bit bulkier, but it works and I use it quite a bit for shoulder exercises. Now, next on the list is an elbow immobilizer. So I use this quite a bit in uh, a lot of videos, but I would like to point out something I haven't pointed out in those videos is it is not very long. So the shorter the lever arm you have, the more likely your arm is going to be able to bend up in it. So it's not my favorite. I do prefer the air splint over this, but I do use this occasionally. But just be aware that you really want something super long that goes all the way from your shoulder all the way down to your wrist. Beyond that, it's got a lot of Velcro on it, so it's just a little bit harder to get on. Now, what does work is I have gone to a knee immobilizer, and that works in some cases because it's longer, but you just have to rig up the Velcro straps a little bit on it because you have to make it a little bit smaller around and so it does require a little bit of like rigging uh, so just that's something to keep in mind but I have used it and it does work on some people and then I just take like an ace wrap and just wrap an ace wrap really tightly around it because again it's a little bit too big around all right next on the list is a Pilates ring now, again, these are all things I've gone over in other videos. I will link the videos below where I use a lot of these tools. But the reason I love a Pilates ring is it's lightweight uh, and it is a perfect tool for working on shoulder flexion. So moving your arms in this direction. Now, this goes along with another tool that I think is absolutely essential and it is, is these Nylatex wraps. They're Velcro wraps that are rubber on one side. That's why I like them. And they're extremely durable without kind of like cutting off your circulation. So that's really hard to explain, but some of you are using ace wraps and ace wraps, you almost have to pull all the stretch out of it. And what it does it has a tendency to start to cut the circulation off in your hand. So I don't recommend an ace wrap. The way that this, the elastic is in this, I just find it to be better. The way that you put it on, is wrap it around whatever object you want to strap your hand to first. Try and kind of get your hand around it. A lot of you have a clenched hand, so your hand will do that. And then you continue to just wrap it around your hand. Pull it tight and it just Velcros down. All right, the reason I like a hand strapped to a plot to the ring is so that you don't have to think about gripping and sometimes it'll allow your overactive spastic muscles just to relax a little bit more when you have to think about holding on to this it might make that spasticity a little bit worse and then you can work on reaching again it's lightweight the reason I like the hands in this position is because it stops some of that arm from rotating in so that is why I like kind of like this nine o'clock and three o'clock kind of steering wheel hand position when you're working shoulder movement. So anything that'll keep your hands in this position, I am a huge fan of. All right, and then next on the list, this is a spatula. So it's a spatula and then I just cut a cutting board and kind of, uh, there's these thin flexible cutting boards and kind of laid it over the top and then duct taped it. So basically what I have is basically just like a surface that's flat with about 10 degrees of bend right here. And what is the purpose of this? This is for your wrist. So using those blue straps with a hand paddle on, if you have a hand paddle or you've made a hand paddle, you guys, some of you have made hand paddles, so that's how I know some of you have them, but, and then just strapping your hand to it. If you're someone where your wrist really tends to flex up when you start to do shoulder movements. So 
tool that I really, really like because it keeps that hand open. Now, see how the fingers will cur curl over it a little bit? You do need to do it with a hand paddle on would be the best case scenario. And then this, um, you can put the elbow immobilizer right over the top of it, and then you're keeping your wrist straight and your elbow straight. Very cheap. I think I bought the uh, spatula at the dollar store. You just want something that has that little bit of a bend in it. And then I just use duct tape. I don't use this anymore because obviously the duct tape, um, you know, if you're using it on a lot of different people, it doesn't work very well. But early on, I used to use this a lot. Now I have other tools that I use instead of this. Things that I have an orthotist here make for me. But definitely something that um, is cheap and will do the job in keeping your wrist extended. All right. Next on the list is a tool that I kind of highlighted in its very own video a few weeks ago, and that is just a skate with wheels on it. It's just a platform to set your hand in to create a frictionless surface. You can move in all directions. I will link the video that I made. The reason I like a frictionless surface for someone that has spasticity or I like a way to make a movement super easy where you don't feel like you need to lift up your arm is a lot of times we're trying to inhibit movement if someone has a lot of spasticity. And so having the ability to rest your arm in something and do a little bit of shoulder movement is extremely valuable if you have if you are someone that has spasticity. So anything you can do to make a movement easier and create some kind of a frictionless surface, which these wheels do, I highly, highly recommend if you want to make this. Again, I just made a video a few weeks ago on this, so I will link that video below. Uh, pretty cheap to make, so if you want something like this, you don't need to go on Amazon and spend $100 on the ones that they sell on Amazon, but you can actually make one for yourself. But the end goal or like the main purpose, I would say, of me bringing this tool into this video is to say that with spasticity, the easier you can make an activity, the better. Because again, we're trying to probably inhibit more muscles than we're trying to activate if you're someone that has severe spasticity. So we need to give the brain the perception that an activity is very easy so that hopefully we can prevent a lot of that involuntary movement or at least a little bit of that involuntary movement from kicking in when you are trying to actually do the movement in the opposite direction. And then that is it for this video. I know that wasn't like a long list and you guys have seen me use a lot of other things, but I think this is the foundation. I think these are the essentials. I definitely think an air splint is essential, a Nylatex strap is essential, and a Pilates ring is essential to kind of start building that foundation if you are someone that has a lot of spasticity. And then of course, you've seen me use dowel rods and resistance bands and a lot of other things on top of that. But I think this is the bare minimum of the things that you need if you are someone that has spasticity and you are trying to restore normal movement. If you like this video and you want to see more videos like this and you haven't yet subscribed, go ahead and hit that subscribe button and turn on that notification bell so that you'll get notified every time I upload new videos. If you want to get exercises throughout the week, head on over to Instagram and follow us over there where I post one to two videos every single week just to help keep your home exercise routine fresh and add a little variety to it. I enjoyed spending time with you all today and I will see you in the next video. Have a good day.